Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Toronto Spirit Society. Welcome all of you watching us through the internet. It's a great summer day out there, full of sun, and we appreciate very much. And in here, full of positive energies for all of us from the uh, spiritual sun that we call our Master Jesus. That's all we, uh, we study here at the TSS. And today we continue actually to discuss um, and to learn and study and be immersed into our theme of the month, studying the parables of Jesus. And we call that in Jesus' arms. Because that's how we feel when we read the stories from Jesus, the parables from Jesus. Uh, through the light of Spiritism that obviously explain uh, things for us a little further for our understanding and today um, we do have um, it's even hard to describe and find the right word because it's a, it's a monument it is the um, the teaching from Jesus to all of us which is the Sermon on the Mount um, it's quite an extense um, not not as much as an extense reading but a quite extensive deep dive and reflection for all of us and I won't steal the thunder for our speakers that are about to come and yes yeah, I said speakers because Today, if I'm not wrong, is the fifth TSS Talks, where we have multiple speakers talking for a shorter period of time, obviously, so we can get different points of view around the same topic. And today we have Otto and Daniel. But before we get into the lecture, I would like to ask uh, Livia to come for the initial reading, and then Marcy Lee for the initial prayer. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, today I'll be reading from the book Happy Life by Givaldo Pereira Franco and Joanna Gianges. Spread hope in the better days. There has never existed such a need for the green palm as now. Hope gives strength to ideals and courage to God's creatures who are renewed, even when all seems to be on the point of being lost. It is hope that sustains us, sustains the hero, and keeps the saint on the elevated course that ha he has embraced. Preserving hope in yourself, your will will never give up, nor feel abandoned, when circumstances compel you to s testimony and solitude. So let us all close our eyes. I strength to connect connection with our master, our big brother, with Jesus. Let's feel his love for all of us, for all, for all the spirits incarnated incarnated in this planet. And let us all be thankful for the opportunity to be here today, to be among friends, so we can feel, we can learn everything that God sent out our way for His Spirit, for Jesus, and for all the good prophets that came. Let's open our hearts to the lessons that we're going to get today. Let's ask also the good spirit to keep inspiring the speakers of the day so they can feel the love of being here. So be it. All right. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let me just prepare myself here. Uh, 
first of all, I would like to thank you all for being here. It is a great pleasure to be uh, talking to you today, but it's a special pleasure to talk to you about the Sermon of the Mount. As uh, G. Clay mentioned, and as uh, many others may have said to you, it's one of the most challenging subjects of, um, of the Gospel. So I'm, hope, I'm hoping that we can deliver the message uh, in the best way possible. And I want to start by saying, by explaining to you what the Sermon of the Mount is. I think it's important. The Sermon of the Mount is the passage in the Gospel in which the in which Jesus pronounced for the first time the Beatitudes or the Benaventuranças as we know in, in Portuguese, right? And th those are the eight Beatitudes that we have from the from the Bible, from the Gospel. I won't talk about them in com like all of them one by one because otherwise we would just end in five minutes probably. I want to talk to you about something else. But before starting, I want to ask you a few questions. Who here heard about the Sermon of Mount before? You can raise your hand. Okay, it's almost unanimous. So almost everyone here heard of the Sermon of the Mount before. And probably on the internet, they are probably ha saying the same thing. If not, it's okay. You can also say, speak to, to our uh, medium there. Um, if, you, if, you, if you heard or not about the Sermon of the Mount. And I want to also to, to ask you another question. Can you tell me if it is important? You can raise your hand if you think it is important or just keep it down if you don't think it is important. So probably 80% of uh, what we have here today uh, believe it is important. It's an important topic. But I want to bring you some facts about the, how important it is. Some facts and some quotes. The first uh, thing that I want to bring to you is that 20% of the Gospel according to Spiritism, this book that we use in our Gospel homes and uh, in our studies on Wednesdays, for example, is based off the Gospel, the, the Sermon of the Mount. So it's mo more or less like this. So it's a good amount of, uh, of the Gospel according to Spiritism that is based off these eight Beatitudes. It's really, really important to remember that. Another thing that I wanted to bring to you is that uh, Givaldo Pereira Franco, for example, once mentioned in one of his lectures that the Sermon of the Mount is the most remarkable philosophical contribution to human completeness in all ages of history. This is coming from one of the most important uh, mediums that we have today, one of the most impressive speakers that we have today in the Spiritist movement. and. But we, you can be thinking that those are two sources from the spirit, two spiritist sources, right? So I brought another one that is Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi once said as well that if humanity had lost all sacred works and only the Sermon of the Mount remained intact, the world would have lost nothing. So this is coming from someone who was not a spiritist, but in his heart he had love, right? So it's, it's important to remember that this is something that doesn't matter if it is someone who is Christian or not Christian, it is something that goes beyond uh, Christianity or religions. And I wanted to ask you the third question that is going to basically drive the, 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 the whole presentation from now on. Do you know when and how the Sermon of the Mount happened? In which circumstances? And you can just raise, I don't want to put you on spot. Just raise your hand if you think you know and just keep it down if you don't think you know when and how it happened. Perfect. It's really perfect. Oh, I have one there. <laughs> That's good. Uh, so we have one in this, uh, in, in this group. So probably maybe, uh, I don't know, 2% <laughs> of we have here. So it's it's what we are going to talk today. I'm not going to cover the Sermon of the Mount. I'm going to cover what happens before the Sermon of the Mount. That's what I want to tell you. I want to tell the story that is written on the book Boa Nova. And I have an earlier version of it here. That's uh, good news in English. This book has, um, has uh, uh, one story that is one of the, the, the chapters here that's called Sermon of the Mount, of course. And this, uh, this story basically tells you um, what happens before the Sermon of the Mount. Don't worry, because Daniel is going to cover the Sermon of the Mount itself. Don't, don't, you don't have to say, oh, you can, you can be okay, because he's going to cover that for us. Um, but this chapter specifically gave me a different perspective of the Sermon of the Mount itself. I thought I knew the Sermon of the Mount. I thought I knew the, the, the Beatitudes. But 
I honestly changed my mind or it gave me a different angle, a different perspective for the Ceremony of the Month. Now, who wants to hear the story that we are going to, to talk about today? <laughs> Great. Oh, it's, I'm, I'm happy because it was not, not only my wife who raised the hand. <laughs> Let's... Uh, Uh, so let's uh, let's go back in time 2000 years ago let's use our travel time travel machines let's go back 2000 years this is the landscape so you can see this is the sea of galilee and you have those mounts nearby we are in capernaum if you want you can close your eyes and just hear the birds chirping you can think about the the crickets you can think about the na all the nature that we had at that time we had no electricity remember that we had no refrigerator, we had no air conditioning, no heating, no, not even newspapers we had at the time. We had no such thing as social media, Twitter, Facebook, nothing like this. That was Jesus' time. Can you imagine all that? No. Just one person, because he heard, she heard so much about it uh, during this week. <laughs> That's my wife. Um, but if you, can, if you can think about it, you can probably think that it's hard to believe that Jesus was already famous at this time. 2,000 years ago, with or without Facebook, we had Jesus as one of the most remarkable people at the, uh, uh, in, in, in his time. He was famous even before birth, so the prophets were announcing his coming, so, right? so he's, he was really famous. He was not only famous before birth, but even as a child, he was also uh, doing all those marvelous things like uh, curing people or discussing important topics of the law with the doctors of the law. So he was, as a child, he's already, he was already really, really famous already at that time. Now, let's remember that we, were, we are in the Sea of Galilee, <coughs> in this area, and because we are in this area, the, most of the disciples who were chosen not long before the Sermon of the Mount were uh, fishermen. So at least uh, four of them that we know for, for sure, Peter, John, Andrew, and James, were fishermen in that area. So there were, because they were fishermen, they, we can uh, believe that they are um, humble and poor people. And Matthew was the only one from the disciples, from, the, from, the only, from, from all of those 12, that was a tax collector. And as a tax collector, he had a pretty comfortable life from a physical comfort perspective. Just remember this. This is going to be important for the story that I'm going to tell you about. So, putting this together and going to the part that we know that Jesus was already famous, right? People were looking to for, Je for Jesus at that time, um, but they were not searching using Google or something like this, right? So they had no such thing at that time. So they were searching to for Jesus through the either going directly to Jesus or through the disciples. In the book, you remember you also learn that uh, the disciples were uh, surrounded; that their homes were surrounded by by a, a lot of people, and they were looking for explanations about the gospel, explanation about the good news. They were they were looking for information about about it because they wanted to 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 evolve, right? It also is, it is also rem uh, important to remember that Jesus, uh, not Jesus, the, all of those guys who were surrounding the people, the disciples' homes, were um, were poor people, were humble, were going through a lot of difficulties, uh, a lot of diseases, disabled. So so many things were going through their lives, and that was uh, was uh, was the, the 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 most of them who were surrounding those um, disciples' homes. Now. Let's go. Let's start the 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 present the the story itself. Let's put all this together and let's think that this is the first. Those are the first days of apostleship. We are in the early days of uh, the disciples, and a number of those unfortunate people came to Matthew's house. Remember, Matthew was a tax collector, and here you can see like uh, Jesus. Um, just uh, selecting him as a disciple, as a tax collector, and as a tax collector, he had a pretty comfortable house. He he had a one of the most big houses. Let's let's think about it at that time, and he was um, he was surrounded by by a lot of people, those unfortunate, disabled, with a lot of diseases, going through afflictions and all all that. And let's uh, imagine that those people who were out there 
were there to offer probably the only thing they could offer. They were there to offer themselves to help building the, gospel, uh, the kingdom of God with the disciples. That was their, their mission there. They wanted to, to help. What do you think Matthew would say? Probably in, in normal conditions, I, they, he would probably encourage those guys to help and so on. But he had a, it was earlier, earlier days of, uh, their, of himself being a disciple. So he had uh, some misconceptions. So as a tax collector, I believe that he, was, he had uh, this uh, more knowledge and more education than the average at the time. And probably because of that, he, with an air of um, maybe superiority among them, let's think that he is outside of his house, and the house is, be, is behind me. You are all the, those poor people and humble coming to help me to build the kingdom of God, right? And then I just ask you, what can you do in your conditions? What would you think? Is it, isn't it uh, harsh to think that someone would ask you, what can you do in your conditions? You are poor, you are disabled, you are going through so much things. And he asked actually uh, three of them from the crowd, Lisandro, Aquila and Paphos, those are the names there, uh, specific questions. He was asking, for example, how can you help Lisandro, disabled as you are, pointing fingers? You can imagine pointing fingers to you and asking you, what can you do if you are disabled? And then he asks, what about you, Akila? Haven't you been abandoned by your family, accused of all terrible things? Abandoned because they were accused of, of terrible things. And you, what about you, Paphos? Would you build anything good, knowing that you are going through such much, so much affliction in life? So those are the three types from many other types of people going to, to search for Jesus through the disciples, right? Disabled, accused of terrible things, going through affliction in life. In their hearts, those poor people, those humble people, had the message of love from Jesus, right? Jesus was already famous, as I mentioned. He was preaching already for a long time. And for some reason, Matthew did the exactly opposite. Instead of love, he gave harsh words. So, they left the house. They left completely completely discouraged. But they knew that Jesus was going to preach the same day on a mount nearby, right? So because he was going to preach, they left, but they were around. That's when that's when Math, uh, Jesus and uh, Andrew arrived and, at Matthew's house. And remember, Andrew was one of the fishermen in the sea, at the Sea of Galilee in that area and they started to chat full of joy and they started to discuss how to spread the good news they were it was the, one of the earlier days of, uh, of the apostleship right? so they, they were planning how to to talk about it how to talk about the good news to to all the other uh, the other good brothers and sisters right and Matthew explained with an air of superiority again like love with a shin up and also with some naivety probably at the time what happened moment earlier, moments, moments earlier uh, to, with, uh, with, the, with the humble people, right? And he finished saying, What would the gospel of the kingdom achieve with such beggars, poor, and disabled people? So this is the misconception that uh, Matthew had at the time about the poor, disabled, and so on. But at the same time, he, rem he remembered that the other the other apostles, the other his friends and his uh, his colleagues, right, were fishermen who humble and so on. And he tried to correct himself by saying, "Well, it is fine to 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 wait something good from the fishermen of Capernaum, as they are strong and brave. So the hard work is for them. On the other hand, I don't see how these unfortunate and losers would help. See, this is this is." He was trying to make things better. He actually is making things even worse because he's he's discriminating the some of uh, some of them. He is making uh, the disciples only able to be part of the, the the disciples because they are strong and brave. So this is not the way to go. And this is not only Matthew's opinion about his uh, about his colleagues, but also about the other the other humble humble people, right? And imagine that Jesus probably could read. Matthew's mind at that time. 
he's such a such a level of evolution that he could probably read uh, Matthew's mind. So he had to explain why Matthew was wrong. And this is Jesus saying I have to, to read because this is so, so much important for me to, to misinterpret, right? However, Matthew, we must love and accept the precious help of the defeated of the world. If the gospel is the good news, how can there be no divine message to them, the sad and defeated, in the immense humans, uh, human family? The winners of the earth do not need the good news. In the feats of earthly life, creatures hear the voice of God much louder. This is us, right? We have gone through so much suffering. This is what we go through. We have we have so many uh, problems in our life, and this is a time where we where we when we pray more, right? This is the time where we that we hear the voice of God much 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 louder. So this is the message also for us this time today. And Jesus continues, when we look at the oppressed, the afflicted, and the slandered, we feel them so united in disguise in their hopes that we recognize the, in the quiet courage they review a sublime reflection of our Father's presence in their spirits. Have you ever observed a winner of this world with a greater concern than to defend the fruit of their material victory? So he's basically telling that uh, all of us, when we when we have so much, we 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 get so much from our material victories, we are probably thinking more about the more our material victories than everything else. If we are if we fail, if we go through struggles, we probably listen more to God. Now imagine Matthew. This is not your buddy, just telling you. Oh, don't say about this is about our, your about humble people. No, it's not buddy. It's Jesus Himself, our Master, giving him a lesson. Right? You can imagine how embarrassed probably Matthew was at that time. So he thought quickly about it, and he said right away, "Master, all I wanted was to speed up the supremacy of the gospel between the ones who govern the world." See, this is all good intention this is he's trying to speed up the supremacy of the gospel he's trying to make things faster he wants to to make everyone everyone understand the gospel but this it's not only about intentions it's about about the execution it's about the way the proper way to do do to do those things and i'm not going to tell you how what's the proper way this is jesus saying uh what the, what's the the best way to to, to approach this and jesus says who rules the world is god and love do, does not act with uneasiness. So you see, he speed up, uneasy, love, uneasiness. So he's basically challenging this. And who rules the world is God. So he's, he was trying to speed up the supremacy with un, going to, to the doctors of the law, going to others who could help maybe more, but it's actually the opposite. Who rules the, who rules the world is God. And Jesus continues. Because he wanted to, uh, to describe exactly what this phrase means, right? Now let us imagine that the victorious of this world came to us, demonstrating their shiny weapons. We picture some Roman generals arriving in Capernaum with their numerous and bloody trophies, claiming to be willing to accept the gospel of the kingdom of God and offering to cooperate in our endeavor. Surely they would bring legions of guards soldiers, clerks, and scribes, triumphs, swords, and prisoners. They would then begin to protest about our preaching in the wild roads of nature. That's one of the reasons why they would build sumptuous stone temples, the construction of which they would fight hard for inferior hegemonies. Don't we remember of some things that happened maybe later on? So building stone temples, a lot of uh, fights for inferior hegemonies. And Jesus continues, some would like superb palaces, others would undertake the construction of wonderful gardens. Recalling the actions of their deadly swords, they might try to, dis to dispute the establishment of the kingdom of God by iron and fire, exterminating each other due to the fact that they would not agree to each other. And since the victor of, uh, of the earth is judged 
in this world by greater sum of rights and importance. Under the pretext of fighting in the name of heaven, they would spread fires and devastation throughout the land. And would it be just Matthew to work for our father's will to annihilate his children, our brothers? This is probably Jesus envisioning seeing the future, right? So he, was, he could see what would happen depending on the way, the path we selected at that time, right? And then comes Jesus with uh, probably the most beautiful passage of this, of this book or this, this story. He says, Matthew, it is important to intensely love the unfortunate in the world. Their souls are the earth fertilized by the fertilizer of tears and the most ardent hopes, where the seeds of the gospel will blossom into the light of life. This is amazing, one of the most beautiful passages of this story, and he basically is telling that us, we are all souls fertilized by the fertilizer of tears. We have to go through such difficulties. That, that's, we have to go through this to evolve. We have this as uh, one, of, uh, one of the things we have to go through. through. And then the, the, the lesson, ended Matthew learned his 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 lesson and that's when James John and Peter the other three fishermen remember that I mentioned in the beginning arrived in a, at Matthew's house and they left to to the mount in the twilight of the day you can hear the same birds chirping the crickets you can you can hear all that no newspaper no facebook no nothing like this and hundreds of people were waiting for Jesus. Hundreds of them. Hundreds. Of, you can you can imagine how 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 many of them were because most of them were going through so much dif difficulty, so much struggles, right? And in between them, we had like a trembling elderly, simple farmers, women, and many people with so much uh, difficulties, including financial struggles or or any other disease that you can imagine. And his image appears in that land, beautiful landscape that you can see there, shining even more than, than the golden sky there. And then he pronounced for the first time the Beatitudes that Daniel is going to cover for us. Um, the message was so important for Matthew, not only for the sufferers of the world, but for Matthew as well. And Matthew learned. He, he thought about it right away. He was... He had to meet again the other three friends. Remember Lisandro, Aquila, and uh, Paphos? He met them again, the ones he reproached earlier that day. And he apologized sincerely and from all his heart. And that, that was not all, the only thing he did. He opened his house, the one that he was acting as a security guard in front of it and let nobody in. He opened the doors. He, lo he let everyone go in. They had dinner and so much joy the whole night together. You see, this is this is this is Matthew. Can you can you see the difference between the beginning of the story and now, from reproaching to rejoicing with them? This is the transformative power of our Master Jesus. This is the way the world is going to regenerate. It's not an atomic bomb that is going to destroy everything is not a massive uh the just just massive uh destroy destroy math, uh, weapon that was that is going to to destroy everything and everything will be rebuilt no it's heart by heart and that's the way we have to to face this we have to change ourselves we have to transform ourselves we had so much so many lectures about inner trans transformation this is the jesus invitation for us to transform ourselves and I wanted to finish saying that if Matthew changed himself, we can we and he, as a disciple, we can all change ourselves. We have to transform ourselves. And Jesus finished his day saying, "Blessed are the ones who listen and understand the words of God." Our message today is let let us not only listen and understand, but let, let us also practice the words of God. Thank you.
morning. Good morning. I see we are not no longer in those times you have more technology <laughs> nowadays. Easy to spread. Yeah. Give me just one moment, please. Uh, Otto just did an amazing job giving a great introduction about the historical context in which the message was preached by Jesus. And I wish I could talk about all the eight Beatitudes, but then I need to spend the whole Sunday with you here. I guess this is not the plan. So actually, I'm going to talk about just the first one, which is a lot. Which is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And let's just think about a moment that when Jesus preached that, he's not talking about poor or rich in the material sense. He's not talking about money. He's talking about spiritually. And we can interpret that as blessed are the men who understand that he's spiritually bankrupt because we are actually broken without God in our lives. And to acknowledge that, we actually need to step back and we need to be humble. We need to be humble to have the understanding that we cannot solve everything by ourselves. We need to be humble to actually understand how big we are in relation to the world that we live in, in relation to the big universe that we habit, in relation to our, our brothers and sisters, human beings. So the poor in spirit actually means humble. And the book, The Consoler, psychographed by Chico Xavier and dictated by Emmanuel, they ask the question, how to understand the beatitude preached by Jesus? <coughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit. And the answer is, um, this is just a passage and it's a free translation. The teaching of the Divine Master referred to the simple souls that did not possess the spirit of ambition and selfishness that customarily triumph in the struggles of the world. It referred to the unpretentious and humble hearts able to follow his teachings without low-level concerns of material existence. So now we just reinterpret and bless the poor in spirit, which by itself is not so easy. We understand that poor in spirit is a, it's an idiom. It's an idiomatic expression that actually means the humble. And by saying that, Jesus by no means is making any allusion to ignorance, to lack of culture, to he's actually exalting the simple hearts that discovering life from every angle of existence, a treasury of blessings. So this is how we can actually understand the message and start interpret by that. Interpret it. Now, let's step back a little bit and let's try to understand what's humidity. And this is actually great because as Otto was introducing and bringing us so much information, he used the word humble many times. And humble humility or being humble is a word that generates a lot of confusion. So first I want to actually share with you the understanding about what humility is not. Humility does not mean to be poor, not to have money. Uh, you can find people living in big houses, people that have a lot of money and have a very humble heart. And you can find homeless people that does not have a humble heart. I remember last year with my co-workers, we had an event when we were learning to make pizza dough. And there were many left leftovers, like full baking pizzas that weren't touched. And we were around this area where you have a lot of homeless people. And we had the idea, so why don't we go and you give some of this pizza to some people who might actually enjoy it? And I remember that when I approached a few homeless people, they just looked at me like, why are you offering me that? They have such a resistance that sometimes people, it's not because sometimes they might need the help, sometimes people feel offended when you try to help. So being humble has nothing to do with your material condition. Being humble also doesn't mean that you need to be sloppy, that you need to dress poorly, or that you need to drive an old car and never take care of your appearance. You might have some personal preferences about how you want to dress up, 
what car you want to drive, but you can't actually be said to be humble just because the way you dress. And also, be humble doesn't mean to be ignorant, right? If we, if we remember the Spirit's book, question 115, talks that all men have been created equal in terms of knowledge. And what differs the knowledge of every one of us is actually how much effort do we put in our learnings and the trials that we go through and the way that we face and then we learn with these trials. So being ignorant has nothing to do with being humble. So this is what humility is not. And to define humility, I'm going to think humility is the exact opposite of pride. And what does, how, how is someone who is pride? Someone who is pride is someone who is always trying to be or to look something bigger than he or she actually is, right? This is what we can consider in a way a pride person. Therefore, a humble person is a person who doesn't need to be bigger or look different than what the person actually is. And there is a, there is a saying that says that who tells the truth doesn't need to memorize anything. Because if you're actually true and honest to yourself, you don't need to wear any masks. You can just feel free to be who you are, acknowledging your good qualities and also your imperfections. And one important thing is that it's not many times if we have, if we possess some knowledge, we need to put that into practice. Because many times, let's say, if I need someone help and ask a question here about, about the gospel, and let's assume our friend here, he knows the answer, and he says, I'm not gonna raise my hand because I wanna be humble. I don't wanna show. Maybe he's not being humble. Maybe he doesn't feel comfortable talking about it. Maybe, but it's not because he's not raising his head that he's being humble. So we actually need to work in favor of God with all the qualities and characteristics that we've acquired throughout our life. And the question is, how do we actually practice humility? And the answer that I have is that we need to look at the inside, inside ourselves, inside our souls, inside our hearts, and not at the outside. Because many times when you look at the outside, just like in the image here, we might, we might have the impression that people have a better life, that we are in the wrong place, and we might not accept our reality. And first of all, this is not true because all human beings here have a unique journey. We know nothing about what everyone else's journey is, right? We just know the struggles that we go through. And especially in these times where we have a lot of social media, where we have a lot of ways to actually show and demonstrate and try to be something that we don't actually are. So it's, it's very harmful to look at others in a position of comparing, because this distracts us from being who we really are. And now I just want to do an exercise here to, to show a point. We have these two shapes, shape A and B. Uh, can anyone or everyone together tell me what color is shape A and shape B? Gray and white, right? Now, you see? And it's actually the same color. They're, the image is not changing. So this is an optical illusion that is just showing me that when we compare two things not in the proper manner, our perspective about the facts might change. And the same applies to ourselves. If we actually, instead of looking to ourselves, we look at others too much, we might not realize what are the things that I need to look within myself that actually need work, that actually needs improvement. What are the things that actually matter within myself? This is what I wanna uh, illustrate. But at the same time that I put that together, one question popped up in my mind. Can't we look at others, can't we admire others as role models? Right? This is a legitimate question. Is that like not being humble? Is that comparing yourself to others? And I'm going to give a personal example. I really admire Haroldo Dutra Dias. And there are two main... Haroldo is a Brazilian famous spirit speaker. And 
two main reasons I admire him. First, because of his knowledge and everything that he stated about the doctrine about Jesus. And second, because of his speaking skills. So I look up Arodo because of those two characteristics. But when do I do? Once I realize what are the things that I admire in Arodo, I look at myself, Daniel, and I ask, how is my knowledge about spiritism? Do I need to study a little bit more? Do I need to put a little bit more knowledge? How are my speaking skills? And then I'm able to actually look inside and work to improve, if that's what I want. It's different than comparing myself to Arodo. That wouldn't actually be something product productive. There are no better or worse. We are unique. We're just different. And sometimes we like to compare ourselves to others because we have pride, right? We have sometimes, I don't know if you have, but I can sense that in myself sometimes. You have a desire to, to be better than others, the desire to be special, as we say in Brazil, the desire to be VIP, right? <laughs> and so this is something that we need to pay close attention. And I want to tell a story that illustrates an example of, of humility. Chico Xavier, who I think most of you know Chico pretty well, right? And, but Chico represented humility in many sense, all his life and all his work. And then he, because of that, he gained fame in many, in many, small, in many cities, in many places in Brazil. And many times he was honored with the title of a honorable citizen of, of the town. And he was invited once in a small town that where he was actually receiving this title. And many times he just actually went there, not because he needed to be praised, not because he needed people to tell how good he was, but actually because he understood that by doing that, he was helping spiritism and the message of the gospel. And everyone important of the city were gathered together with Chico. And they asked Chico, where do you want to visit in the city? And they imagine, right? We have the town, we have the, we have the townhouse, we have the lake, we have so many beautiful places. And he said, I want to visit the city's prison. And everybody was like, I mean, what, what are you talking about? The prison, it's such a beautiful sunny day. And said, no, I want to visit the prison. Okay, if he's asking, then let's take him there. He, the gates were open, he walked in into the prison, and after being there, he asked the following question. In how many are we here? He did not ask how many prisoners are here. He did, not ask, he did not ask how many criminals are here. He asked, in how many are we here? Putting himself in the same position as the others. And then I wonder, I reflect about that. And I don't you think that Chico probably was aware that he knew more about the gospel and that he probably had achieved a little bit more, if we can say it like that, spiritual enlightenment than most of his fellow human beings there? I think he knew that. I think. But did this make him think that he was better than anyone else there? I don't think it did. Because possibly he knew that it's not because he was better or knew more about something that he knew better about anything than anyone else there. And that's a position of actually being humble. And I want to tell another story, and this story, it's not documented in the gospel, but it's a story that has been passed through generation to generation, that it's about Jesus and the dog. Uh, in that time that Otto just asked everyone to imagine and to envision, there was once a dead dog, and he was decomposing, and he had a terrible smell. And all the apostles, as they were passing by and walking by the dog, they could just realize what a terrible smell actually had there. And he looked at the dog and they said, Oh my God, that dog is terrible. What a terrible smell. And then Jesus, he actually stopped and said, But do you see what beautiful, even white teeth he has? So even though everyone was paying attention to the bad things that the dog had, which would be pretty obvious to us, Jesus actually looked at it from a different perspective. 
And this illustrates a point that the perspective on how we see life, the perspective on how we actually see the struggles that we go through, they are super important to the way that we face our trials and that we can and that we can actually gain gain knowledge about how to behave. And I want to give an example about myself when I first moved to Toronto. I did not have a car, so mainly I used the subway and public transit. And I had the perception that Toronto was a busier city than it actually is, right? Because I was always like on Young Street, I didn't know the city. And then, after my son was born, I bought a car and I started to drive to places I had never been before. My perception about the city changed again. When I went to CNE Tower, I am enthusiastic, I like going there whenever I can. Also, I saw the things, I saw the city from a different angle. So if the angle to which I see the city changes by the mean of transportation that I use, don't you think that the same applies to our spiritual life? If we actually see and face our lives with the light that this is just a small part of our life among the eternity that we're going to live, this, how, how big or it doesn't make less painful the problems that we go through, but it changes the perception and might give us some strength on how can we face all the difficulties that we go through in life. And to connect with humility, don't, if we adopt the point of view of humility, we will see things in a similar perspective as if we adopt the point of view of pride. I don't think. So, I think that if we actually adopt this point of view, the way we face life might change significantly. And the question then is, is the world we need to change? Or we need to change and then see the change in the world? As Otto mentioned, right? It's not by destroying everything and rebuilding. It's by touching heart by heart. So, it's within our power. Sometimes we are very impatient because things take time. We have one small existence and sometimes I look at the world, I look at the news, I look at all the bad things, I look at the things that happened to me in my life and sometimes you have a feeling of this is unfair, the world is not actually changing. But actually we are looking with our own lens. If you put things into perspective, things will change and we are responsible to the work that we need to do with our own hearts. What did Jesus see and what does he actually see right now when he looks at us? So how did Jesus taught us the lesson about humility? Did he just send some words and he looked from a position of being above? Or he actually came, he incarnated as a human being, a very poor man, and he actually led us by example. And I think this is one of the reasons, whether you are a Christian or not, you know who Jesus Christ is. Because he actually did something that was actually impactful and very meaningful. Important to note that even though he adopted this position of humility, he was always true to himself and to the values that he needed to convey to us. He, whenever he faced difficulties, hardships, whenever he was confronted or threatened, he always said the word of God. So he was humble, but he never compromised the values and the things he was trying to teach. And to actually to be humble, it's like, it's like whoever is a parent here. When you're talking to a kid, sometimes you bend down your knees, you speak the same language, you, you make eye contact, and you put yourself in the same level as the kid. This is actually the way that we can be humble to others, just like Jesus has been humble to us. And we can say, well, but I'm not, I'm not as good as Jesus. I'm not as good as Chico, I'm not as good as Ivaldo, sometimes I might not be as good as the guy who lives next door. And I just want to say that I don't think it's about it. There is a passage in the epistles to the Romans where Paul of Tarsus, he wrote, For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. So this is just a small passage where Paul was actually saying, what kind of man am I? That I do bad things that I don't want to do, and I don't do the good things that I want to do.
And, and that's very powerful, right? Because how many times don't I want to be gentle, want to do good things to my friends, to people who I love, and sometimes I just, mm, I say something or I act, behave in a way that I look at myself and I say, no, that's not the right way. And many times I just had no plan, right? And if you're, I don't know, working, you're stressed or you're in traffic, you just do something bad, very bad, just something that you don't even know the impact, right? You don't know the impact that a word can have on someone. But the good news is that Paul, he was faced, he faced something similar, and he actually described that. But so it does not mean that we should not feel that. Paul felt that, but it actually means that we need to be aware and control. Because the big question is, who controls our behavior? Are we in control of our desires, of our feelings, emotions, or are our emotions in control of ourselves? And there's another passage of Paul in the book Paul and Stephen that describes the life of Paul. And Paul, he lost Abigail, his fiance, when he was still young. And after he saw Jesus and he got blinded in the desert of Damascus and Jesus talked to him, he changed his life. And he started to be a preacher of Christianity and to devote his own, own life to spreading the message of Jesus. And he, he went through many hardships. He was stoned, he was cursed, he was beaten, his father rejected him, his family rejected him, his old friends rejected him, all because of what he believed in. So he spent a life of blessings because spiritually speaking, he was never alone. But many times, materially speaking, he did not have those who he loved the most supporting him. And at the end of this journey, after he was stroked by a Roman soldier that killed him with a sword, he wakes up in the spiritual reality. And he's still struggling. And then Ananias, the same man who had cured him from being blind in the desert, he comes to him as a spirit and he heals Paul. And then Paul, he was looking forward to see Abigail, his fiance, for a big part of his life. And the only thing he's thinking is, where is Abigail? And Ananias realized there is something going on within Paul's souls. And then he asks Paul, what is it? Paul waits, he reflects, and then he answers, ah, I, where is Abigail? I wanted to see Abigail. After that, Jesus, in spirit, together with Abigail and Stephen, they walk in the direction of Paul. And Paul is very excited. He looks at Abigail. What would you feel if you were in that position? You wouldn't want to run and just hug her right away, right? But Paul had learned a lesson. Not that he should not feel things because he just gained the status of ascent, but he needed to control his impulses. So he just looked at Jesus' eyes, sort of waiting for his approval, or waiting to understand what the master would have to say. And then Jesus looked back at him and he said, come here, Paul. He hugged Paul, and after that, he said, you can go and you can join a big IO. And then again, he calmly goes and he joins a big IO. So the big thing to me is that we can actually control ourselves. Sometimes you, the Catholic Church considers Paul a saint, but it's not that you don't have feelings. It's all about how you deal with the feelings and the struggles that you have in your own. And is being humble a characteristic? Because many times that's what they think, right? Oh, Shiku was born like that. Okay. We know that we gain things and we come with things from previous existence. But what I want to emphasize is that it, it's actually a choice. And it's a choice that myself and everyone here can start making right away if we want to be humble or if we don't want to be humble. And just to summarize with some key takeaways here, uh, because we've discussed a lot, so one thing that Otto mentioned in the beginning, the Beatitudes are the most important lessons that were taught. And this is great because sometimes we get into the feeling that it's very hard for me to improve because I haven't studied, I don't have the time to study the whole gospel, I don't have this time, right? But it's eight, eight Beatitudes. If we actually memorize that and start making sense of that, this can be a very powerful tool for our day, daily lives. Also, it is said in the gospel that having a humble heart is an act of love towards God. 
we need to remember free will, as I just mentioned. To be humble or to become humble is a choice. It doesn't mean that just happens overnight, but it's actually a choice. We need to be very aware and pay close attention to our pride, to make a self-evaluation to know whether we are being proud or not. Another thing is the point of view we adopt is fundamental. So just as the perspective that we might have when we drive the city or if we walk through the city, the point of view that we choose to see life is actually detrimental to the way that we are going to face the challenges and the struggles that we have. And last, when Chico was starting his work as a medium, Emmanuel told him, Chico asked, what is the first thing that I need to have? And Emmanuel replied back, discipline. And what is the second? Discipline. And what is the third? Discipline. So if we actually have the discipline, I think we can, we can all get there. And I will leave you with the other Beatitudes, and I hope that we can all study the other Beatitudes together to get more learnings in our journey in this world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Otto. Thank you so much, Daniel. Great, great uh, teachings from all of us. Um, we do have a very few minutes. I wonder if anyone has any questions before we uh, wrap up. Carlos, or digital medium, as you said, well, any questions for anyone on the internet? No? I think just a final comment then from what I could see is to realize that Jesus never wasted a second of his time among us, right? When he saw Matthew going through those struggles, he immediately taught about the teaching for the entire humanity, for all of us. So every single passage, every single parable, nothing is out of the blue. Right? Everything has a purpose. And that in itself is a lesson that we need to bring to our lives, right? Yeah, we need time to rest, to go to the park, we have to sleep. But what are we doing with our time on this planet, right? Because we are here to, uh, to become better. It's, it's great to see examples like Paul, who is a shiny light uh, in the spirits who work for Jesus. But we can all go on and undertake the transformation that, that he took. And, you know, Daniel touched it in one of the eight Beatitudes. So here is the invite, or the invitation, to all of us to study this at home, which can be a bit, a bit of a challenge to do such thing alone. So I'll leave you with the plug to visit us on Wednesdays, 7 p.m. after the summer that we are going to a study group right now with the book um, Mechanism in the, domain of in the Domains of Mediumship. We will resume in a couple of weeks the study of the gospel according to Spiritism and the Spirit's book. So come and join us. Um, if you can come in person, there's always um, a webcast as well that you can join. That's a great way for us to learn a bit more about the Beatitudes <coughs> and all the teachings from Jesus. So with that, I want to thank you guys one thank more time. Much. Great work. And I want to say thank you to everyone also watching us through the internet. All of you who came here, thank you so much. We are just going to prepare for the passes right now. And have a blessed week, everyone.